Okay, I have a family history and we'll talk more about that when we talk about active surveillance. I want to talk to my sons. I have to tell my son something. And I always would say, yeah, I'll tell you what you tell your sons. You tell them to do everything possible to reduce their cardiovascular risk to as close to zero as possible. And then that takes care of everything else from head to toe. What I wasn't competent to talk to them about is when it came to PSA screening and what else they should do. So, okay, someone asks you, I have, a, I have some sons. I want to talk to them about when I should get, they should get their first baseline PSA. You said 45. Does that mean everybody or are you willing to push that back even further for someone that convinces you they have a family history? Yeah. So first of all, you know, I've stolen that line from you from, <laughs> from the times we were lecturing together all those years ago. And I use it all the time in, in the office. If I would have had it, man, I'd be the richest person in medicine. <laughs> no, I mean, I honestly, and, and you know, it's a bit of a side note, but the, the whole concept of the teachable moment at the cancer diagnosis is one that we, you know, at the whole group of us at UCSF have always taken very seriously. We've been doing diet and lifestyle intervention work forever here with June Chan and Stacey Kenfield. And there's no question you know, I can think about some guys specifically who, you know, we saved their life, not by diagnosing the cancer, but because by getting into healthcare for the first time in 20 years, you know, you start having the conversation about the smoking and the diet and the, and the obesity. Uh, and they come back next year, you know, on active surveillance, 30 pounds lighter and, you know, much more active and, you know, and, it, and it's, it's, it's really gratifying. So, you know, and, and we, we really try not, not to miss the forest for the trees, but yeah. getting back to your question, yeah, um, you know, the, it's, it's a little bit tricky because typically it's not me having this conversation, right? It's usually primary care. And, you know, every time I give a talk like this to a primary care audience, you know, one of the comments is always that the guidelines are too complicated and the screening protocols are too, too complicated and you need to keep it simple. And for the concept of keeping it simple, 45 makes a lot of sense to me as a start age, partly because men are rarely even seeing their primary care providers um, in their 40s, certainly not much before that. And because we really have very few data below 45. Um, you know, having said that, men with family history, and when I say that, I mean strong family history. Everybody's got an uncle or a grandfather or a cousin who had low risk disease and didn't get treated. But somebody who has, you know, their father, their brother, their grandfather all had it. Their father actually died of it at a young age. Um, you know, real family history, or they've had genetic testing and they actually have a mutation in BRCA2 or one of these other related genes, um, then we should really think about earlier screening. And the same applies maybe to other high-risk groups like African-American men. Um, that's a little bit controversial. I think when you see a, a combination of factors, you know, African-American men with a family history, then um, you know, some of the guidances from the American Cancer Society, for example, will push it back to 40. And I've, there are some families where, you know, somebody died of prostate cancer really early where I, I have recommended a test of 30. Um, I have a 42 year old in my practice who had lymph node mets at, at um, a time of surgery at 42 years old, you know, this is bad genetics. And, you know, when that yeah. sort of predisposition is running in the family, you need to think about it very differently.